Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Pachuto, and I'm very excited to have the one and only Mr. Dustin Rabin on with us today. Dustin is a world-renowned rock concert photographer, um, a huge inspiration for me personally, and I'm excited, extremely excited to have him on the podcast today. Dustin, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, John. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. I'm so very excited to have this conversation, um, not just because we're both mutual Yankee fans, um, but because I'm just a giant, giant fan of your work as a photographer. Um, can you give a quick introduction to the listeners into who you are? Sure. And first of all, I want to say thanks for having me. And I, I really appreciate um, those kind words about about being a fan of my work and um and also, it's great to talk to another Yankee fan because we don't have a lot of those where I live in Toronto. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> um, yeah, my name's Dustin Rabin. I've uh, just celebrated my 30th year as a, I guess, rock and roll photographer, which always sounds kind of, I don't know, it's a weird thing to call yourself, but that's <laughs> what I'm known as, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been 30 years. October 12th, 1992 was, wow. was the first one. Um, and so I spent the last bunch of weeks doing a retrospective on my social media accounts, just posting my favorite. I was going to start doing my favorite photo or my favorite job from each year and have it last a month, like do one a day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there were some years where thankfully I've been fortunate enough to have too many great things happen in a year to pick just one. So it ended up stretching out the whole process to 10 weeks yeah. and I posted 120 posts. Um, and it was fun because I typically don't get, even if a post gets a lot of likes, I don't get a ton of interaction like comments or DMS of people saying, Oh, I saw your post. Um, thanks so much. I really love those photos. It doesn't really happen. It's just people like the pictures, and to me, that's great. People see them. If they like them, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but this was really different because I, the first few posts were really focused on my very first experience shooting a concert, and then I gave a bit of background, um, what I was doing before, and um, it just turned into uh, a series of rather lengthy stories instead of just the date and venue and the name of the band i was writing things that happened that day and how this relates to another job i might have had in the past and people actually read them like i got a lot of comments and people commented about things at the very end of the post so i know that they're reading the whole thing and it it was a really great exercise for me to do and um really really cool it, it was awesome to hear from people um, in that way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was a big fan of the project. I've, I've been following you on Instagram for a while. So getting an opportunity to kind of dive through your archives of what has been, you know, a 30 year career, which is just incredible, um, was fun just as a friend being able to like witness and, and see all that stuff. Um, talk to me about the beginning. What was the first show that you shot in 1992? Uh, it was a band called 5440 who are, uh, they're Canadian from the West Coast as well. I think they're from Vancouver and I'm from Victoria. Mm -hmm. And I had done a few interviews for the college radio station and the college paper. Um, I was in a journalism program and I had done some interviews. And for some reason for this one, it was over the phone. Um, and at the end, the label called me and said, hey, do you want to shoot their show? They're playing in Victoria next week. And I'm like, I can do that? <laughs> sure i whatever like i just brought the one camera with one lens i had and uh a roll of black and white film and i just kind of they're like okay you can go up to the front row for three songs and the whole thing just felt weird like <laughs> why do i get why the first three songs and why am i going in the front row in front of people and it was just like awkward but then once I realized that was like a thing people do, I got really, really into it. Yeah. Isn't it funny 30 years later that three song rule still exists? <laughs> uh, some, yeah, it is the weirdest. Yeah. Okay. The, I, I understand that, that, you know, an artist doesn't want to have 20 plus photographers. Totally. Staring at them with their camera the entire show because it's distracting and it's a layer between you and the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I found that I've always found weird is why the first three? Yeah. I know maybe they want to get it over with and not see you, but 
the best pictures always come from the end when they've they're worked in they've been playing for an hour they're sweaty yeah they're playing their best stuff um it, so yeah the first three has always kind of blown my mind it's, a little bit it's just such a funny uh funny role and just one that endures makes it even it's just like one of those really funny cliche rock and roll photography things which i just i have an appreciation for but it's also like pretty silly um yeah first uh, three songs no flash (laughs) like yeah what you hear every time um 1992 you bring your one camera your one lens what was the like immediacy after you had those photos developed and you're you know looking at those first concert photos that you talked did you that you took excuse me did you know immediately that you were like this is what i was meant to do this is why i'm here I don't know if I looked at it like this is what I'm going to do for a living, but I definitely said to myself, I want to do this again. And I want to, I want to take pictures of my favorite bands. Like I like 5440 a lot, but I didn't, they weren't the first band I shot because they were like my goal. Right. You know, as a photographer, it was just that they gave me an opportunity and I took it and I thought, okay, this is fun. I like doing this. I have a lot of bands that I love that and I, I go to a lot of concerts and I just love I love rock and roll photography. I mean, I never looked at that as a job that, that that would be something I would end up doing, but I've always appreciated music magazines and concert photography and, you know, tour pictures out of magazines, have them up on my wall from probably age 12 onwards. I just had bands on my wall. Um, and so now looking back, it's just so crazy to think that people might have my stuff on their walls. And it's just like, a I never, ever, that wasn't the goal yeah. at that time. It wasn't like someday people are going to look at my work and put it on their walls. It was never that. It was just the fact that I was such a big music fan and such a big live music fan that the experience of being there, taking the pictures was the exciting part for me. I appreciate that tremendously. So I've, I've been, I'm going on two and a half years full-time photography. Mm-hmm. And uh, after I shot my very first show, it was for um, the, uh, it was a cover band and then some like independent artists, a small, small band at a small venue really close to where I live in, in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, and I, I never really put much thought into like what type of photography I wanted to do. I just wanted to make a living taking photos and four to five seconds into the first song and snapping my first photo i was like holy fucking shit this is what i want to do like to me there was an immediacy to the feeling that i got when i looked at the back of my camera the second that i took that first photo that i was like oh yeah this is what i want um as a music lover as uh you know an avid uh consumer of content centered and around music um as a former musician like these are all things that i you figure would <laughs> naturally align themselves to a career um but man did i did i catch the bug early on um and i can totally appreciate that sentiment um out of curiosity you have worked with some of the biggest artists and bands in the entire world um yeah. one of my favorite bands we have a mutual ad- admiration for is the foo fighters um you've had the pleasure of shooting them a myriad of times um talk to me a little bit about your relationship with with that group with uh with with some of those iconic photos that you've taken of dave Grohl, um and what that sort of process was like from the early years all the way up into you know recently i, I believe you guys shot something in like 2014 um the last time i saw them was 2018 on their on their big uh stadium tour um but yeah the first time was july 1995 so they'd been i think they had just released the album i saw them once before um a few months before but i didn't get they didn't approve it wasn't them there was a music conference in vancouver and the conference didn't approve me for accreditation that year Mm -hmm. um and because I didn't have anybody to shoot for, but that's another thing we can talk about later. Uh, So I I don't think the album was out when they played that first time, but the second time they came in July, they had a record out and, you know, it's, it was in everybody's eyes. He was still the drummer from Nirvana because he still hadn't taken the Foo Fighters to the point where they were a standalone band, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, they'd been, fucking amazing since the beginning like that first record is probably still my favorite yeah but it there was still 
all anybody wanted to talk about was Nirvana in interviews. And uh, so that was the excitement there was just like, oh, my God, it's fucking Dave Grohl. Mm -hmm. And at the Commodore Ballroom in Vancouver, there's the, I guess, the stage entrance where they do all the load in is in an alley, um, an alleyway just behind the venue. And, you know, whenever a, a, a fairly famous band would be playing, there'd always be kids out back, you know, waiting for them to pull up in the van or their bus and um, hope to get an autograph and a picture or something. So, of course, I went back there with the goal of, I just kind of wanted, I don't even know what I wanted. Like, I wanted to meet him. I think I might have wanted to interview him too, because I was still doing interviews, mm -hmm. which I was horrible at, but it was kind <laughs> of the way that I got into this whole world was um, I got a lot of opportunities to interview bands. And then they'd say, do you also want a photo pass for the show? Um, so I think maybe I wanted to just meet him and ask if I could get an interview. But once I got there, the van pulls up. And they all kind of come out one at a time and there was no manager. I think they had like one roadie, but he was, he was just some kid that they knew. Like it was really an informal mm -hmm. kind of environment. Um, long story short, they were all, people were all kind of staring at him, like just loading his gear and talking to the, the local crew and whatever. And it just felt awkward having like 30 people or 40 people in a circle around him just trying to work. Um, and finally, when he was done talking to the guy from the venue, I just went up to him mm -hmm. and I said, hey, my name's Dustin. He goes, hey, I'm Dave. And I said, I'm, I'm shooting the show tonight. Um, I'd love to somehow get these pictures to you. And he goes, yeah, well, give me your info and we'll get in touch. And I gave him my card and he was like, cool, thanks. And he put it in his pocket and I kind of walked away like, holy shit, that was unbelievable. <laughs> um and he actually, oh, no, wait, one more very important thing happened right after that was he said, we're playing in Seattle in a couple of days if you want to come see us there, too. And I said, sure. So he put me on the get, said he was going to put me on with plus three so I could bring three friends. Um, it was a bit of a drive, though. So I told my friends, you know, we're going to, it's going to take us a few hours to get there. We might not even be on the list, but let's see what happens. Worth the risk. Yeah. And I got there and... I was there plus three and I had one all access pass and I walked in the venue before doors opened and Dave happened to be right there. And he's like, dude, you made it. I'm like, holy shit, man. I can't believe you put me on the guest list. And he pulled my card out of his pocket and he's like, I told you. Wow. Like he, and, and then we had a really long chat after the show. Um, and he just, I don't know. He, he just kind of took a liking to me and said, you know, if, if we're ever playing, wherever you live or you know we're in the same place uh same place at the same time bring your camera and he was really um supportive i guess you could say you know he he always gave me access and he was always appreciative when i bring him prints from the last time i saw him and and um it just kind of started from there and, and then i it was so exciting that i would travel to go see them um, knowing that I could probably get in to take pictures. And then it, it really boosted my portfolio. It boosted my confidence. Um, I was able to shoot other bands because they, you know, management companies and promoters could look at my portfolio and see like, oh, wow, he's shot a lot of Foo Fighters, you know, and um, that really helped out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what One of my I think probably the, the biggest thing that has drawn me to your work, just like, you know, I, I started sort of as doing street photography and documentary photography. Um, there is that sort of like pull behind the curtain kind of aspect to, to your, um, th there's like an intimacy to your work, right? And you, you could notice it, whether it's the stuff on stage, whether it's behind the scenes, whether it's specific portraits that you've taken. Um, there is that sort of intimacy that you've been able to build with whether, you know, it's hard to say whether you know these people five minutes, five years, five decades, whatever. Um, but that as like a, as a person who admires quality photography, for me, there is something intimate about your images. And it's, pretty much regardless of, of the venue, right? Whether it's backstage, on stage, etc. Um, when you work these shows, um, is there a particular aspect of the environment that you really love capturing moments wise? As a, 
as a lifelong music fan, I've I, I've always been interested in those behind the scenes moments that you don't normally get to experience. And for me to have access to that, I fully get into it. Like I think, okay, well, if they're letting me shoot here, I'm going to take a lot of pictures here. And I know that people enjoy seeing that as well. And it makes me happy to kind of be able to share a viewpoint that you wouldn't normally get to see as a fan at the show. Um, because I feel like it, I almost feel like it would be kind of selfish of me to get like this golden ticket and not really share yeah. the experience with other people because I'm a huge music fan myself and I know how much I would love to see that, you know, oh, that's fucking cool. I appreciate that. Um, um, and then the other thing about just the, you know, the intimacy of those kinds of photos is that I, I'm a very shy person. People don't really understand that because of my job being on stage and meeting all these, you know, famous people and think I'm super outgoing, but I'm actually quite shy until I feel really comfortable around people. And so I try not to draw too much attention to myself. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm on stage or if I'm in a dressing room particularly, or just backstage, I don't like getting in the way. I don't like, the feeling that people are watching me work. So I tend to just kind of be pretty casual about it. And I think that in turn, the people I'm photographing let their guard down a little bit and it just turns into a very casual thing. And the photos end up looking very natural because I'm not bossy or like, can you go sit over there? Can you go do that? Unless it's a proper planned photo shoot. I don't like to, um, I don't know. I, I yeah, you don't need to be pushing. I don't. Your, yeah, I don't want to yeah. be invasive because this is their private space, and I'm just lucky to be there. I think that is a a very accurate description of why some of these photos look um so relaxed and intimate because of that unassuming nature that you have. Um, obviously, an audio podcast is the perfect way to describe. <laughs> <laughs> amazing photography photos that i'm a <laughs> huge fan of um i uh i took the liberty of going through a significant portion of your archives and i was blown away by the range of subjects of people that you've worked with you know whether it's bands actors um etc um a couple photos that really stuck out to me um that i had some questions about was there is a portrait that you did with annie francis sorry annie murphy from uh schitt's creek um there is something in insanely wonderful, and uh, it, it's hard to describe how much I, I really appreciate and enjoyed that photo. There was this sort of like almost famous sort of vibe with it, um, you know, from the uh, shit. What the heck's the guy's name? The with the with the jacket. You mean yeah, like with, with that the kind jacket. of oh yeah yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's why it spoke to me because I love that movie so much. Uh, even though Cameron Crowe has me blocked on Twitter. Um, I, uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay. But yeah, tell me uh, tell me a little bit about that photo and uh, and what sort of went into the uh, mindset when you made that portrait. Oh, man, I almost don't want to tell you because you'll be like, that's it? <laughs> um, she was still, like, Shit's Creek was still in full production, but she was doing um, a, a web series... Uh, called the plateaus and she played a musician and so a friend of mine was producing or no a friend of mine was directing the series and he asked me if i wanted to shoot stills so i went out on a bunch of days and that was i remember it exactly we were shooting in a music venue in toronto during the day and there was a the stairwell between the first and second floor is just this really bright it's just all windows and I can't remember if I asked her like, Hey, come over here and we'll take a picture or if we were both hanging out in the stairwell or whatever. And I said, Hey, stop for, for a second. I want to get a photo. So it was very, very quick and natural. It wasn't like a, there's literally no setup, but we were just either there or I said, Hey, come over here for a second. I snapped one and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, but she's actors are just so much more photogenic because and it has nothing to do with looks, really. It's just they're so much more used to having their picture taken than musicians. So it's it always amazes me how quickly you can get a really great photo of an actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a perfect example because it was 
actually probably took less than 30 seconds. I think. And it, if it stuck with you, then I'm like, OK, well, that that shows that. It, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I think for all the times that I'm in studio or, or working on a job, it, most of the times like the quote unquote usable shots, the ones that end up being the selects happen within like the first 15 minutes. And I think there's super super magic in simplicity, right? Like you said, you're in a hallway, mm -hmm. you pulled her aside, you saw the light was hitting a slight way, the jacket looked perfect, and you're like, boom, and then you nailed it. Um, I mm -hmm. think that's, I think there's something to be said about being able to like create something beautiful with that level of simplicity. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I, I think it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I, I think along the same lines, but the opposite way for in the first 15 minutes, for me, it's usually the stuff at the end of the day, but that's because after getting all of the all the shots that I thought I needed and the ones that I had to light a specific way, those are all out of the way, and now I can just kind of have fun for the last little bit. Ooh, that I do so agree it, with. I do agree with. So that. it's uh, for me, it's the opposite. It's the last bit as far, far as the big uh, instead of the beginning, but it's for the same reasons. It's yeah. because it's simple and you're not. Yeah, once you check off the, that shot, yeah. yeah, you check off the shot list. You're like, okay, now I can kind of relax and do the things that I want to do. And 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 yeah, no, I agree with that. That makes sense. And I think the subject relaxes at that point too because they figure, okay, we're done. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I think it's funny because like you, you know, like you said you're shy, um, and I wonder if there's a, a bit of unassumingness about you that allows for a, like a quick amount of rapport to be built amongst strangers, right? Like you know, celebrities are just us, musicians are just like us, but you know, at the end of the day, they get hounded for this stuff a lot. So I, I'm I'm curious if you think maybe that shyness or unassumingness of of your ease in which you come to approach a subject helps sort of get this candid, um, sort of beauty. It's hard to say. I, I I agree, but at the same time, there's another factor, which is when you're shooting a band who's on tour and you're not really doing it for anything big, it's just like they're doing you a favor by letting you take their picture or whatever. Like if the management's like, sure, you can get 15 minutes, you know you've only got 15 minutes, um, sometimes less, sometimes five, 10 minutes after sound check. They'll say, sure, okay, this is a good time. Let's go do it. So I was from the beginning used to trying to get as much good stuff as I could in the least amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've gotten good at, at, at doing that. Like, even if I have more time, I won't dawdle, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think that's where it came from, but as far as relating to people in a short amount of time, yeah, I feel like I'm pretty easy to talk to myself, you know? So yeah. I'm not, I don't know. One of my uh, probably top two favorite intimate portraits that you have is of Steve O and his dog. Um, yeah, that is just such a wonderful, wonderful photo. I mean, it's everyone who knows Steve O knows him from Jackass and jumping off buildings and doing crazy shit. But there is just such a quiet wonderfulness in that photo. Um, and it's just like, you know, I'm a dog person, so like seeing a person and their dog together, um, I don't know, man, that, that photo just really stuck out to me as something that like really touched me just like, you know, when you're going through someone's work and getting an idea of what type of photographer they are and, and what type of work they produce and, and, and what their work and art says to who they are, um, this photo just really, really stuck with me in terms of like, it's just beautiful. It's, it's just like a really, really wonderful portrait. Thanks, man. I I really loved that photo too. I mean, when I was doing when I was doing this uh, retrospective on socials, um, that one came up a couple of weeks ago, and I hadn't looked at it in a while, and it really touched me because, you know, I mentioned in the little description that you know when when someone says Steve O's agreed to do a photo shoot with you, you're like, oh man, I don't even know what to expect, like. <laughs> He's never not doing something fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, and I know that people aren't always the same, you know, in public as they are in private or whatever. And they might, you know, be like, okay, I'm, I'm not doing anything crazy. That's just the thing I do on TV. Right. So I didn't really know which, which version of him I was going to meet, but he was, he, well, I'll back up a little bit and say that it was a, a photo shoot that I had planned with one of the rescue dogs from this rescue that I used to volunteer for. Um, 
I didn't know he'd be bringing his own dog. I know that he travels a lot with her, but I didn't know if he'd be bringing her to the studio. Um, but he did, and it's his dog Wendy, who's like his soulmate. I mean, he they you can see it in that picture. And immediately I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to do pictures of him with his own dog because that's a way more uh, genuine s scenario, you know? And um, it was just beautiful from the moment he got there. He said, I had him sit on a stool and this giant German shepherd like hopped up on his lap and he just hugged her and smiled and had his eyes closed. And it was just this beautiful moment. And no amount of planning on earth could have predict predicted that. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm going to try to have a really sweet moment with Steve-O and his dog to show that there's another side of him yeah. that people don't see. I had no fucking idea. Like, <laughs> I was shocked. And it really it really made me look at him in a different way. And, and just his love for animals came out in that whole story, too. And it just made me look at him in a different way. And, um, yeah, I could never, ever have planned for that. Yeah, I think, you know, there, 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 therein lies the power of photography, like being able to capture just such a truly wonderful spur of the moment, intimate moment between a guy and his dog. And I think the caption that I read was something like, uh, you know, true love or like this is true love or something. And uh, I like it's like you can see that in the photograph, which I think it just speaks volumes uh, to what photography can do in relaying story and telling uh, what life is really about, which I, I think is 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 wonderful. Um, I'm biased about the photographs, biased and jealous about the <laughs> photographs that you have of Aaron Judge and capturing um, his oh, chase, man. his chase <laughs> for sixty two. Um, tell me about that. Um, what were you who, like? Was this just like you showed up to the game with your camera? Did you have a pass? Like, what was the process like? Because there is a photo of I think he launched his 61st home run and it's yeah, like the tying home run. Yeah. yeah. He's like perfectly sort of, uh, you know, spun around and it's like this perfect, like back silhouette, him watching the trajectory of the ball kind of thing. Um, talk to me about what that was like capturing that moment as a fellow Yankees fan. Well, the streak that he was on, I just assumed that he would have surpassed the record long before the, the final series in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't really planned on shooting that until a week or so before. I was like, damn, this might line up that he'll do it here. Yeah. Um, so I reached out to the Yankees PR, who I pretty much every season I'll reach out to them and say, if you need a photographer while you're in Toronto, I'd love to do it. I'm a huge Yankee fan. And and, uh, you know, as usual, it's like, thanks, but we, we've already got someone touring, like, you know, they have a, a photographer that goes on the road with them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to buy tickets and try to find the best place for each game to be able to shoot from. And the, the one where I got the seats I had for that night, never in a million years that I think I would get. Yeah. Game one, I was in the front row of right field bleachers so i thought well at least i'll get to see him up close if he's playing right field mm -hmm. and just photograph him on the field um and every at bat i'd be zoomed in on home plate and just like this is the one this is the one you know and then he, he didn't out four it. times <laughs> or you know, he walked like eight times over three days yeah right yeah and then the second game i was in the front row on the 500 level but right behind home plate so even though it's really high up you're not that far back and i was i could get him to fill the whole frame. It was like, I thought, okay, I'm so glad he didn't get it yesterday because this is the place right here. I'm going to get it. And all five at bats, he walked or struck out or got a hit, I think one hit. Um, and again, I thought, oh man, that would have been so great. These seats were fucking perfect. And then the third night I was going with my buddy, John, and he said that his, his aunt's friends had season tickets and they were behind the Yankee dugout, like eight rows back. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that'll be pretty fun, you know? And I get there, and just because of the way that it's laid out, like the first row along the first baseline is kind of in front of the dugout. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine the seats right behind the dugout, row eight is actually the first row. Oh, shit. Because right behind the dugout, it starts at row eight. So I was on the dugout right there and the step yeah the steps that lead up and down to the dugout 
were right in front of me. So the players were like five feet away. Oh, and the, the night before when I was looking down at where the photo pit is for media, I pointed down there and I, I told my friend, I said, there's the Yankees photographer. That's going to be me someday. Yeah. And then the next day, I swear to God, she was five feet away from me because <laughs> the seat was absolutely the perfect seat in the whole, in the whole 50,000 seat stadium for me to be. Mm -hmm. And it was completely unexpected and unobstructed, <laughs> unobstructed. It was wild. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that people don't understand unless you're a big baseball fan or, you know, especially if you're not a Yankees fan, but that was like a monumentally. Historic it, it, it was one of the greatest moments of my entire life. I'm not even exaggerating. Like I grew up a Yankees fan. My dad passed away when I was 21 and he, he raised me a Yankee fan. So I always feel like, it's a connection I still have with him oh. and just to feel that, I don't know, that it, I'd been planning and working so hard for weeks trying to get a pass and trying to get the perfect seat. And then at the last minute, my friend says, yeah, we've got these seats behind the dugout and they were better than we expected. I don't know. It was wild. It, it's... And the, the, the seat to the left of me, like this play, it was as sold out as it gets for a yeah. Toronto game when they're not in the playoffs. And the seat next to me was empty for the first bit. And I thought, oh, this is good because now I can kind of lean over to my left to get around that, like where the wire comes down to hold up the net. Mm -hmm. I was kind of blocking my view. And I thought if there was somebody sitting next to me, I wouldn't have gotten that shot. Yeah. And my, my friend goes, dude, your dad was sitting there. Oh. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's actually... Yeah very beautiful and poetic it was wild because i'm not lying when i say that i wouldn't have got that shot if there was someone sitting to my left yeah um oh, man, and I so it, it was like a whole other layer of good feelings that night yeah i mean i think that's pretty cool i mean i'm, I'm a diehard yankee fan i've been going to games since i was born so just like going through a rock and roll photographer's you know incredible back catalog of of work on stage behind the scenes portrait work Getting to see like one of my favorite current Yankees, you know, accomplishing a monumental career goal and you getting an opportunity for, for to photograph it was pretty cool for me. Um, and they're just like really awesome, great photos, which is is is, is pretty fantastic. Um, you've had an extremely lengthy career, right? Thirty years. Um, when you go through a timeline and sort of do the retrospective that you have over the last ten or so weeks looking back, um, what is that process like for you when you're looking at what has been an accumulation of incredible moments, incredible memories, getting to document some of the biggest, most famous people on earth? Um, what comes to mind when you have an opportunity to go through that sort of retrospective? Uh, two words, exciting and overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause yeah, at first, like I said, I thought it would last a couple of weeks and I'd pick one picture per year. I don't know what I was thinking. I know that's not possible to do <laughs> to pick one photo from a job is hard, you know, yeah. when you're, you're going through pictures, but for a whole year, um, and yeah, I got a little bit overwhelmed after the first week. Cause I thought this could last a month or two. And I really thought I'd try to get it all done within a month and that took 10 weeks mm -hmm. and it, you know, bad, bad problem to have, you know, yeah. that, that I have too much stuff. But I think that the process was I, I have a, a job list, like a written list of jobs in a book. And I went through that and I looked at each one and thought, okay, was there anything great here? Was there anything great there? And it was pretty easy for me to pick out the jobs that I wanted to feature, but then picking the photos within those was really tough. And I maximized pretty much every post, I think. Like on Instagram, you can do 10 mm -hmm. posts. And I, a lot of them had 10. Because I have a hard time deciding. Was there, was, there any, was there any moment when you were going <laughs> through some of those jobs and looking at some of those photos where you were like, had to pinch yourself or like, holy shit, like, I can't believe I fucking did this. Like, how, how many times were you like pinching yourself that like, this was your life? Um... I've got bruises on my arm, let's put it that way. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that to brag, like that I've had a lot of cool things happen, but it's I'm it's more of 
the gratitude that I have, but also just the, the realization that this isn't normal. Like this isn't something you can just pick up and accomplish. Like these are incredible things that, that I've, that I've been fortunate enough to be able to do. And I understand the rarity of those things. Yeah. So I don't, I, uh, so when I'm looking through these and I think, I still think like, holy shit, I can't believe I did that. I didn't believe it at the time. And I still don't because it still hasn't, I still haven't come to a point, and I don't think I ever will, where it will just be like, yeah, whatever. You know, I've done that a million times. Like, I know people like that, you know, I know, and yeah. whatever their job is, they'll do crazy stuff that anybody would kill to be able to do. And after a certain point, they're like, whatever, man, it's just a job. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I hope I don't think, and I'm pretty confident I'll never get to that point. Um, yeah. Because... I just, I love it so much that it, I appreciate every single second of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally relate. It's it's very funny because we're having this conversation in polar opposite directions of careers, right? Mine's very much beginning. You have 30 years under your belt. And mm -hmm. my goal in life is to be a tour photographer, is to go on tour with, uh, you know, a band or a musician that I adore and be able to have that documenting process. Um, it's It's been all I've sort of been trying to put together for myself over the last two and a half years. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's clear that this would be this type of career that would allow one to like continue that, you know, amazement and, and be, uh, constantly, you know, happy and excited to get to do it because it is not normal to be able to have that level of, of access and be able to put together a, a body of work that spans such a long period of time. I mean, it's, it's goals, it's hashtag photography goals. Like I can, I <laughs> yeah, it's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's wild because while it is, it has happened often enough and consistently enough where I could get to the point where I think, ah, no big deal. But it, it I don't know, I guess when you're doing what you love, you know, you, you don't, you don't get tired of it. Yeah. Um, and I think I'll just go real, real quickly back to the, to the whole thing with the Foo Fighters is that pretty much every major milestone I've had in my career is due to that meeting when I you know when I met Dave and gave him my card and and he said why don't you come down to Seattle um that sounds either directly like, or sorry to yeah. interrupt you that that sounds yeah. like the opening to your biography it it, it will be yeah for sure whenever why don't, whenever that happens yeah, why don't you come it, down to uh to Seattle yeah. it sounds like a great first line sorry go ahead <laughs> and, no, but no it, it I know it just sounds too crazy to be real but um and it, it's directly and indirectly and when I say that it's either directly because he is friends with somebody that I want to photograph. And if they said, Hey, I saw that, you know, this guy, Dustin that wants to shoot me. What do you think? And he's like, yeah, totally. He's a great guy or whatever, yeah. whether it's directly like that or indirectly where people, you know, they see that I photographed him a bunch and they're like, yeah, man, I want this guy to shoot me too. Yeah. So, and, and it, and it's no exaggeration to say that almost every big thing has stemmed from that. That's really fucking cool, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I think there is there that's like the the beauty of life, right? Like at the end of the day, you aspire to achieve a goal and do something that sets you up for everything else. Like I I feel I feel very much that way in my life. Like I feel like everything that I've been working towards for the last two and a half years um, has led me to everything that will come to fruition in the future. And it's a miracle if it happens at, you know, in your early twenties, right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. So it's, it's like, it's taken a bit of time, but at the end of the day, like that is, I think that's the point of life, right? Like you get the opportunity to do something and it resonates with you and you kill it. And then that opportunity is what sets you on a path for the rest of your life. Like I, I fully believe that. Like that's fate. That's karma. That's like how things are meant to be. I 100% agree. Um, and the funny thing is, though, you don't see it at the time. Yeah, oh yeah. Like you can say, "Oh, I have to take this opportunity." Like you can make the conscious effort to take an opportunity. But while you're doing that thing, whatever it is, you might not think this is going to set me up for the rest of my life, or this is going to lead to that, which is going to lead to that. I mean. I, I don't know. I, I thought to me, it was just like, I really want to meet this guy. He's fucking cool. And he's in the biggest rock band of my generation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was a no brainer. And just, 
Yeah. And then, but I, I honestly didn't know that I was going to turn this into a career or that I was going to, um, that, that the photos that night or meeting him that night was going to turn into like a lifelong thing. I just thought it was something really fucking cool and fun and exciting. And it made me want to do more of it. Yeah. But I, heard... it, I didn't look that far down the future. So it's, it's incredible to see that now I can say, yes, that moment did completely change my life. I think that's awesome. I mean, that's really fucking cool. Um, I, I mean, it's like that. Yeah. I mean, that that's, that's the dream, right? Like I, I think that's, I was really weirdly impacted by the movie. Yes, man. Like say yes to everything kind of thing. Because I yeah. think like when you open yourself up to opportunities in life, like even if they're not necessarily going to be financially beneficial, even if they're not like, you know, going to be world changing events, you never know the who, what, when, where, why, and how in life. And if you open yourself up to the opportunities that life presents you, I think good things can happen. And taking the opportunity to shoot one band 30 years ago led to a career that has amassed thousands, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of images Mm -hmm. and moments and memories that you'll never forget. Yeah. And it, I, try to say yes to as many things as I feel that I want to, you know, like if some things like, yeah, why not? I'll do this. Yeah. And it's not to say you can't say no to certain things, but I believe that if you say no to enough things steadily, they're just, the opportunities are going to stop coming to you. Yeah. The universe is like, well, we're not going to waste our time with this guy. He doesn't, he's not following through on any of them. So I really believe that, that you have to put yourself out there. And if you, if there's something that you really want to do, take advantage of those opportunities. Cause if you say no to too many of them, they're just going to stop coming. Oh yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, when you look back at 30 years, um, and all that you have accomplished, what does it look like for you to now look forward? Right. We're recording this a few days before new year's, um, 2023 is a, uh, nipple hair away. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what does that look like for you when you look at like what else you need to accomplish and like what else you want to do, because you have multiple decades ahead of you to continue to work. So what is that like sort of thought process like for you? Um, it's a really, it's really interesting timing because before COVID I, I had come to the conclusion that, you know, rock and roll photography is the most fun thing I've ever done. And it's supported me for years, but the industry's changing. Uh, it's financially less stable than it once was. Um, you know, and you get to a certain age where you're like, okay, well, this was a lot of fun, but I need to, you know, sort out the rest of my life. So there were thoughts of like, well, maybe I'll move on to something else, but I'll never stop doing what I'm doing. But I do, I did make a conscious decision to make a shift. Um, I want to do more film, like on set photography for TV and film. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened and everything shut down and I really had to think about what I was going to do next. Like most of us were forced to do, you know, really take a look at what's going to, what the future holds. And I thought, yeah, I think it's time for me to just open up a new door and say, I am absolutely open to doing, to continuing doing what I've been doing because I love it, but I'm going to open a new chapter as well. And, um, so then the, what happened in September was I finally, after 30 fucking years, finally got to shoot Pearl Jam for uh, like their whole, a whole show here in Toronto. And to me, that was just perfect. It was like a month before my 30th anniversary. And I thought, well, that's the last one off the bucket list. So I think it's a good time to really uh, make that, that move to the next chapter, which is hopefully working in film and TV um, because that's something that's fascinated me my whole life. I, before I ever shot a band, I was going to work in film. That was my dream. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was, you know, working as a production assistant and working in the art department and doing a whole ton of stuff until I hit 19 or 20 or actually when I stopped all that when my dad passed away because he was working in that world too. And it was just too hard for me to continue working with all of his colleagues and, mm-hmm. You know, so that's why I made the shift to photography. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that now I'm like, well, I'm going to go back to film, but in a different capacity. I want to be a photographer on film. I don't want to work in the same departments that I 
thought I would be growing up, but I definitely want to, I want to work in film. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I relate to that tremendously. I like, you know, there seems to be a sort of natural progression in, you know, content creation that everything is going video in the future. And for me, I'm not the biggest fan of, I have no aspirations of being a director, like, you know, incorporating some amount of videography into my photography work is going to be a necessity just for stupid fucking algorithm purposes. Um, Mm -hmm. But I don't have aspirations to direct a feature film or anything, but like getting the opportunities to shoot behind the scenes stills um, has been a a very fun byproduct of, of sort of my documentary photography that I've, I've gotten to do recently. It's a lot of fun. There's not a lot of pressure um, because what you, what I at least am doing is not really looked at as being all that important. Um, And I think it's a really cool avenue and an opportunity to get like some really cool candid stuff. Um, So I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, no, I agree that that's fun. And it is, I mean, when you break it down, it's it's pretty much the exact same thing with different people. You know, it's documentation. It's, you don't have control over much other than the framing Mm -hmm. and your exposure and capturing the right moment. Like you can't direct the people to, to do what you think would look cool because they're making a movie. They're not there to get, you know, or they're playing a rock show and same thing with lighting. You know, you, you just have to take whatever the lighting director at a concert or the director of photography decides on a movie set um, and just work with that. So it's really very similar. Um, and it's still behind the scenes in the entertainment world, which is what I love the most because I, I like being able to see what happens behind the scenes. I like being able to show people what goes on. And so it's just... Uh, you know, it's actors versus musicians, but it's this, everything else to me is identical mm-hmm. in the workflow. Yeah, I like that. Um, I'm very curious, um, first things first, if you've ever done any street photography. I would say no, never. I mean, I've, I've done, I have photographs that are of people on the street, but I would never consider myself a street photographer because that is an art unto its own that I cannot, Again, because of my shyness, I just, I feel like people are staring at me when I'm holding a camera, but they're not. Yeah. But in my mind, yeah. I'm not comfortable doing street photography. And I have such a huge admiration for, for the greats because um, they put so much of themselves into each picture. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little yeah. surprised to hear that just because there's so much of that sort of street documentary style to your work that I that I, you know i'm shocked that it's never been something that you've really spent much time doing because like your work is very evocative of that sort of street and documentary style well i i think that the big difference for me is the um being self-conscious mm-hmm. you know? like taking pictures where people don't aren't there to get their picture taken or they don't know that you're there they yeah. didn't ask to be there to me that i feel very very self-conscious whereas even when i'm in a private area of like a dressing room um they know i'm there right you know i'm not like i hope they don't see me or i hope that they don't yell at me for taking a picture so this the style is very reminiscent because i am capturing moments that are not planned but at the same time for me there's less of a, a self-conscious feeling because at least I know that if they want me to leave, they can say, could you just leave for a minute or yeah. whatever, no, but I, they know, that, they know that I'm there. Yeah. I get that. Um, talk to me about the, the conscious decision that you make for, I don't want to say most of, but a, a vast majority of your work being black and white documentary style yeah. versus, I mean, you have color work, obviously, but I'm I'm curious about what that process is like for you. For concerts specifically, when I started, it was all film for years and years and smaller venues with not great lighting. You know, if you get hit with a show that's all red lights, you're not going to get anything. Yeah. And if it's <laughs> black and white, that that solves that problem. So for a lot of it, it was that. And then I started to grow to like the look of black and white over color. And for documentary photography, I just feel like seeing a photo in black and white 
of a scene where people aren't looking at you, where it could be street photography or it could be documentary. I think it just leads you to think of it as being more of a candid moment yeah, as a viewer. And so I tend to present my work that way because it is documentary work. Um, yeah, I like that. I, I... So, and I think even if I'm, if I'm doing work on set, um, obviously if the, if the movie or the TV show is in color and I'm photographing the actors acting, it makes sense for those to be in color. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I'm shooting the actor while the cameras aren't rolling or in between takes or anything, I always make that black and white because to me that just feels like that differentiates the documentation from the um, production stills, which are basically trying to capture what the motion picture camera is capturing. Yeah. Um, I like that. Yeah, I, 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 I very much prefer rock and roll photography to be done in black and white. Um, I think it, it, a lot of what can be distracting from color cuts through when it's black and white. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many pyrotechnics and lights and lasers and things um, that to me, I just naturally gravitate towards black and white uh, music photography, I think. In, uh, and like, I, I agree with what you said. Um, and I think that for some reason there is a innate ability for a black and white photo to sort of um, articulate a story slightly better when it's not muddied by the going on of all of the other light and things that are on in the scene. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like that. I, I agree. And uh, one word that you used is the word that I use all the time when I get asked this question is distracting. Yeah. You know, like a lot of the times, unless the, the, the shot calls for color and there's something that you want people to see because it was specifically in color, mm -hmm. I find color distracting. Yeah. Um, that's why even like with digital, I always set my viewfinder or my display to grayscale because yeah. when I'm shooting something, I don't want to be distracted by that red thing in the background. Because I, I might think, oh, this is going to be a bad shot. There's a big red thing in the background. But if it's if I'm seeing it through the viewfinder in black and white, I'll be looking at the subject and really, you know, it's so, so funny. I, yeah. do the, I do the same thing. I, I, I find it easier, whether it's a portrait session with a model, whatever it is to know whether I nailed something by seeing it in black and white, obviously it's digital. So I'm capturing it in color. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, I shoot in black and white. And then obviously when I uploaded it to my computer, it, it's, it's fully colored, but it, there's, it's easier for me to see in black and white. Like, I don't know what it is. I, I did start my photography journey shooting film, um, even though it was in the 2000s. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just have a natural love for it. Um, and the black and white film, f probably my affinity for it started with like some of the, the great street photographers that I admire. And I, I, I like that style of documenting life, whether it's a person on the street, a musician, an athlete, um, whomever I'm shooting. I see the scenes in black and white, even though they're, they're happening in color. Yeah, I totally agree. I just tend to default to black and white. And like I said, and you said, I have, I do shoot in color as well. Like I have a lot of concert photos that are, that are in color, but it's mostly because there's something extra special about the scene that was due to the color. Mm -hmm. um, but when all, it, all things created equal, if I just want to show, people what I'm looking at unless the color has something extra to add to the story. I just make it black and white. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, you've had a, an opportunity to shoot, uh, probably one of the most iconic magazine, you know, in Rolling Stone magazine, you shot a cover for them. Um, what was it like getting the opportunity to sort of, I mean, like for me getting a photo in Rolling Stone would be, a bucket list of like 12 items getting checked off at once. What was it like getting an opportunity to shoot a cover for a Rolling Stone magazine? I mean, obviously it was incredible, <laughs> um, but it did not happen the traditional way. And it did not, it, it wasn't at all what you would imagine a cover shoot for Rolling Stone being. Okay. It was, it was with, you know, Dave Grohl and Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age and, John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin um, had that band, Them Crooked Vultures. And I had worked with two of the three of those guys a bunch in the past. And then through Them Crooked Vultures, I got to work with John Paul Jones a fair bit 
over the past year before that. So I went to see them play in Toronto and they said, um, I, I went up in the dressing room and Dave pulls me aside, kind of like really hectic. He's like, dude, do you want to shoot us for the cover of Rolling Stone? I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And he goes, okay, well, we need it like right now. And I'm like, we can't do it in here. It's like a dingy room with, you know, I don't have any lights. And I, normally that's fine. Like, I love that aesthetic, but it's not right for the cover of Rolling Stone because they have to put, you know, they have to put the title on and the, you know, all the stories on the front cover, all the text. And, mm -hmm. and I just know that they'd get it and go, we can't use any of this. So it turned into a bit of a chess match trying to figure out we only have two days till the deadline. They're going to be in Boston tomorrow, but they're playing right behind uh, on, on is it Lansdowne Street behind Fenway. Oh yeah, right over the Green Monsters. So they were playing there, and it was during the World Series. Oh jeez. And there was no way that we were going to be able to get in and out of there. Like once they're at the venue, we can't drive to another studio and vice versa. And we couldn't bring lights in for some reason. There was a whole thing, and then we like, hey, the only other possibility is philadelphia sunday and it was on columbus day long weekend and everything was closed and i've never been to philadelphia so i just kind of like woke up in the middle of the night in a panic like okay we gotta do it in philadelphia so i started looking up studios and rental places and finally found this one place where they would open for me for the half of the day <clears throat> i didn't even tell them who it was i just said i really need to i really need to shoot sunday or else this whole thing can't happen um and then, you know, they were late because of traffic and they finally showed up and I did the group shot and then I did individuals and then they had to be rushed off to do sound check. And I was left there like sweating and feeling nauseous, like, oh my God, I fucking blew the biggest opportunity of my life. Like it, 15 minutes to do the biggest shoot I'm ever going to get offered. And I don't think I got anything. And there was only one that I really liked of the whole group. And it was the one that they ended up using with Josh holding his, the collar of his pea coat over half of his face. And I thought there's no way that they're going to go for this. The band won't like it. The magazine won't like it. Um, but I got in a cab. I went to the venue, showed them on my laptop and they're like, fuck yeah, nailed it. I love it. And then I sent it off and it, it went on the cover, but it was, honestly just a rushed kind of shit show hoping to get something because of the circumstances and it's not at all like you would have planned it properly but yeah it fucking works so i fucking love that i think the best moments in life happen within chaotic experiences um yep. yeah I, like any time that you're like struggling to make something work and then all of a sudden <clears throat> you got five fucking minutes and things just fall into place i think that is uh, really fucking cool. Um, I, you know, I, 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 like I said earlier, like this conversation to me is one that I've been dying to have. I've, I'm just such a huge fan of you as a, a human being and your work is just fucking incredible. Um, you're like photography goals times a billion. Um, <laughs> and just like being Thank able you. to hear just how very normal the existence of your career has been is like a reassuring thing to hear as someone who's just starting off and wants to like follow a similar path. And I think that's, what's kind of cool about getting an opportunity to have these conversations, right? Like you are a world renowned rock and roll photographer. You've had access to some of the most incredible musicians in the world. You shot the cover of Rolling Stone. You've been in rooms and with places and people and things that not many, very many people get the opportunity to, but in a lot of ways, those experiences are just like everybody else, right place, right time, making the most of your opportunities. And in a weird way, I think that's what the point of life is, putting yourself in the right place at the right time to make the most of your opportunities and just being able to deliver on the things that you're asked of. I could not agree more. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of the times you see the finished result and you think, wow, that must have taken a lot of planning or this must have been really you know, big studio with a ton of lights. And I'm like, man, I got asked to do this at the last second. I didn't have any, or I had one light, you know, I can't tell you how many times um, I just shoot with one light now because I was forced to in the beginning, either because of budgets or time or space or whatever. And now I just like that look and that's what I'm used to doing. And yeah, you, you, you just, you, no matter how much planning you can do for something, um, 99% of the time it won't turn out the way you expected and it could be, it could turn out even better. 
Yeah. I uh, I don't know what the quote, I'm going to butcher this, but it's like, life is what happy, happens when you're busy making other plans, right? Something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. Um, Dawson, uh, I am beyond grateful for uh, you taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast. Um, I have an extremely cheesy line. If you've been on my podcast, you're part of my family. Um, so welcome and thank you. And I, uh, I'm just incredibly thankful and appreciative and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Well, thanks. And that goes for you too, John. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you. And um, yeah, I, I moments like this just make me feel like I've accomplished something. You know, when somebody else wants to talk to me about my life or talk to me about my experiences, it really uh, it makes me feel good. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome, man. This has uh, been my absolute pleasure and everything I could have asked for and more. <laughs>